I have a confession. When it comes to astrophotography, I have figuratively been operating with one hand tied behind my back, and there are people I know who could blow away my images with less effort. Okay, so if I know that, why am I handicapping myself? Let me explain. My last video here was a comparison of photos of the Milky Way taken from the same spot at the same time by five separate camera models. This year, I've brought back those same cameras plus one addition that I've been very excited to shoot with to capture and compare deep sky images. Now what you should know is that a lot of amateur astronomers, if not possibly even the majority, will use a specialized product that is called an astrophotography camera, cleverly named, and that market is essentially completely captured by a company called ZWO. Here's a manufacturer that is researching and developing equipment specifically for this hobby. The reason these cameras exist is for overcoming two major hurdles of night shots, noise and stacking. So why don't I own a ZWO camera? Well, if you're like me, photography of all types is a run and gun operation. I like to call it guerrilla style. Price and portability are major factors with every shot I try to capture, from portraits to landscapes. There are entry-level camera modules sold by ZWO, but if you want something good, you're going to be looking at prices in the thousands. Sheesh. And that's just for one module, which you'll typically need at least two, one for nebulae and one for planets, as they are completely different tasks. And it goes without saying that unlike the photography camera that you already own, these won't be coming along in your pack for shots of your vacation. But even if money was not an object, there's still the fact that these must be plugged into an external power source, they can only be operated by a computer, and they really only produce usable images when paired with a high-end telescope mount, which, if we were still ignoring money, wouldn't matter. But holy Moses! This all gets to the bigger point that what I've just described is not really a mobile operation. There are guys who do pack this all up into the back of a van and travel to their designated shooting area, though most just set up and shoot from their backyard because it's a lot less hassle. But it is also extremely limiting, and that's the key concept here. We all have to wait for a new moon for the best shots, but if weather or smoke from wildfires rolls in, what then? This leads us right into my setup. I'll be doing this comparison using the Celestron Nexstar 8SE Schmidt Cassegrain Telescope. It has an 8 inch aperture and comes with a star tracking mount. It works best when plugged in but can also run from batteries. It is lightweight and packs up easily, making it a great balance of powerful and portable, which is great news considering that this shootout takes place out in a desert far away from my home where Colorado and Alberta fires have already polluted the skies. At $1600, I wouldn't describe this as an entry level telescope, but it does have some drawbacks. You do have to program your location and manually align your scope each time you use it. Worse yet, the stock mount does not compensate for object rotation, and, as I've discovered, the servos perform a major motion correction something like every 20 seconds, and there's no way to externally tell that this is happening. This means that on a budget, we can't run the three minute long exposures that are typical of backyard setups. Okay, no problem, we'll just capture a lot of shorter exposures and stack them later. Not so fast. This is going to introduce more noise than we'd like, so we're simply not going to be able to shoot anything award winning tonight. Beginners should be told that this isn't really a photography telescope. With an equatorial wedge and a guide scope, you could definitely get more out of it, though of course that means more cost and setup, so I haven't obtained either just yet. But the real message of this video is it's better to go out and get something than to have missed a good night, and by the end, you might be surprised what we come up with. So let's jump into introducing each camera by just showing you the results. Here we have the Canon T3i, 6D, and R6, and the Sony A6500 and A7R5. Every image was taken at the exact same location only minutes apart, with an exposure time of 15 seconds, A6400 ISO, and 5200 for the white balance. The only post-processing I've done is to slightly raise the exposure value to help show the difference between each raw image, since these are unstacked single exposures of only a few seconds. Yet, in each one, you can make out the Eagle Nebula. This probably doesn't look like much to you guys, but I was pretty excited the first time I captured one of these with enough detail to faintly make out the pillars of creation. All right, for comparison's sake, let's take a closer look at these. The T3i was released in 2011, and the age shows in this image with the rampant noise, 6400 being the highest ISO this camera is even capable of. You can still see some color and pillar detail, but even when the images are stacked, you wouldn't likely get a lot out of this sensor. When compared to a modern mirrorless camera like the R6, which in my opinion isn't even the best image in this lineup, you can clearly see good reason to upgrade. 
and that's true even when compared to the other APS-C camera in this shootout. The A6500 is my current travel camera, and as a result, the camera I use the most. Noise is still a problem when compared against the professional full-frame cameras here, but it is manageable, especially if you get good noise compensation frames during your shoot. The A6500 is a significant jump up from the T3i, but still second to last in this shootout. This next image was a bit of a surprise. I wasn't sure if I was going to bring out the Canon 6D for this shoot. It performed well in last year's shootout despite some disadvantages, but given its age, it feels less relevant in this decade. It is one of only two DSLRs included in this contest, but that comparison is completely overshadowed by the comparison to its spiritual successor, the Canon R6. Wow, I was not expecting the 6D to outperform the much newer mirrorless R6 in terms of brightness. That's not to say the R6 is a slouch here, but when we're talking about stacking images, you'd almost definitely be better off choosing the 6D for the night. That was a bit of a shock. Since we're now talking about newer mirrorless cameras, let's put the R6 side by side with the Sony A7R5. I'm not at all surprised that the Sony sensor captured much more light, since low light capabilities has become one of the main things Sony cameras are known for. You'll also immediately notice more detail, higher fidelity edges, and more of the deeper stars in sharp relief. This is due in large part to the 60 megapixel sensor on the A7R5, a significant advantage over every other camera in the shootout. This image would certainly stack well, and I'm hoping to have my hands on this model again in the future for some dedicated shoots. Ah, but wait, there's still one camera I haven't even mentioned yet. You may remember the Canon R1 featured in my last video, which had an Astro Mod service performed on it, meaning the UV IR coating that all cameras come with was removed. Well, now is that camera's time to shine. I mean, there's no comparison. Obviously, a lot more light being captured. To the uninitiated, this might just look like more noise. But for those familiar with stacking tons of short exposures, this is what turns into details after all the software processing. It's worth mentioning that the temperature and tint values had to be stretched a great deal in post, but if you're out to get long exposures or stack images, a modified camera is the one to reach for if you have access to one. I don't own this camera, but I will definitely be borrowing it again capturing this nebula later this summer. When I do, I'll be sure to post that image to my Instagram page. There you can find a lot of my recent star picks. Since this was just a gorilla style camera shootout, I didn't have time to set up an image array for later stacking, but here's one I did earlier this year of the Orion Nebula using images captured by the same telescope with a Sony a7R 4 Sure, it's nothing from James Webb, but I'm honestly pretty happy with how it turned out. It has its own character, and ultimately it's something I created. It just feels cool when you know that you took this picture. Like I said, these are not the best images a person could produce in a few hours on a given night. But if you think about it, everything is relative. The guy who puts 20k into his astronomy setup will reliably produce print-worthy products. But he knows he's not Keck, or the VLT, or Hubble. But I can guarantee you that he still loves those photos because he shot them. I'm the same way. My images aren't as intricate as the backyard observatory guys, but because I'm mobile, I never have to miss a new moon. And if you're willing to pack light, then neither do you. I hope these results were interesting. This was kind of a random set of cameras, but it's just the ones I randomly have access to. Did I feature one of the cameras you've considered buying? Is there a camera you would have liked to have seen in this comparison? I know I definitely have a few that come to mind. Which raw image surprised you the most in this comparison? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for checking out this video and I'll see you on the next one.